Hello, a very warm welcome to episode number seven of the Gita Decoded. As you know, we are going through each and every chapter of the Bhagavad Gita to try and understand what God's message is to humanity. Sister Denise, welcome to episode number seven. Thank you. I'm sure by now the audience is quite captivated because you have a very fresh approach to understanding this ancient scripture. Sister Denise, I'm going to take you back to on what is in my book, um, page 39 or paragraph 39, because um, it contains so much and uh, I think it's necessary that we go through it line by line. Um, this insight is wisdom as declared in the theory of Sankhya. How do you understand uh, this? The Samkhya is one of the traditions of Hindu philosophy that refers to Gyan Yoga and this is called the Yoga of Knowledge. And so Sankhya is all about the method of reason, that this is how you arrive at enlightenment is through the process of reasoning, which is sometimes called Buddhi Yoga, the Yoga of the Intellect or the Yoga of Knowledge, which is differentiated from other aspects of yoga that you find in the Gita. For example, the subsequent chapter will be talking about Karma Yoga, which is different. So Raj Yoga actually encompasses so many different ways to God. And the way of, uh, of Samkhya, the way of knowledge is deep because you have to have a very refined intellect to understand these things and really grasp it to the point of being able to have a knowing not just intellectualized. Yes, Denise, you know, um, if you look at what the world has become, uh, we do not necessarily apply our minds to ourselves and to life and to other people as we should. And um, it can be argued that um, most people have become very superficial, uh, whether they acknowledge it or not, because we live on the surface, as it were, and uh, not go deep. Uh, the Bhagavad Gita invites one to a much deeper level, doesn't it? Absolutely, yes. What does this depth promise the reader? It's scary for people mm. to have to go really deep inside because they're not used to it. We live in a very materialistic world. People are in a state that we in Brahma Kumaris call body consciousness. You live on the surface of your body and it's only about sense perception, uh, objects of the senses and what the Gita is saying that all that is really delusion, illusion and what is real is um, something that has to be perceived through the third eye. So when you go deep inside, you also go closer to your subconscious. And I think one of the functions of yoga, one of the functions of lining up your mind with the mind of God is that it causes all sorts of things to change on the inside. And that's a bit of a upheaval and hence you also have the inner war which is in a way exacerbated by the study and practice of Raj Yoga because as long as you can keep everything sort of tamped down and under the rug you can pretend it doesn't exist but as soon as you start to have yoga you're calling it to the conscious uh, awareness from the subconscious because you can only really deal with it when you have it in your conscious mind. Now, Sister Denise, you mentioned a phrase that is um, uh, going to be brought up later, but because you mentioned it now, I think it's uh, worth further exploration, uh, opening the third eye. Yes. This is what God is doing to Arjuna for Arjuna, his friend. One of the names of God is the bestower of the third eye. And it's also said that it is the um, divine eye and it's also called the eye of knowledge. So what that means is that you are able to see in the sense of understand things that are very subtle, 
uh, that are non-physical, that are out of the range of normal perception. Because God is non-physical and non-human, it's so difficult for people to deal with God. And mostly the feeling is that God is by definition inaccessible and incomprehensible. But here, in the Gita, you have a very different approach where God says, I'm talking, now listen. What he says doesn't really fit with what people normally think, um, because how people think is on the basis of their extrapolations and interpretations of their observation of sense perceptions. Whereas God is not talking about something that you can perceive through the senses, but a different level of reality, which is more real. Also in page 39, uh, the expression is used, uh, yoked with this determination, Arjuna, you shall rid yourself of the bondage of karma. That is a very um, descriptive term. Bondage means uh, <laughs> you're literally chained. So what does this mean to you? And uh, how exactly does the theory of Sankhya help the soul to uh, rid itself of uh, a karmic debt? I'm reminded of the very famous expression from John Locke, an English philosopher, who says, man is born free, but everywhere he is in chains. And these are really the chains of karma, chains of karmic accounts. And this is why part of Raj Yoga is the study and um, application of the theory of karma, the philosophy of karma. So when you do an action, which is based on false awareness, that action causes you to be in bondage. When you do an action based in what we call body consciousness, you come into karmic debt with another person. You start to perform negative actions and you come into debt so then you have to repay, so you are bound to a person. Sometimes people find they're bound to particular individuals, particular places, particular circumstances, and you can't get away. And the type of person that you are will dictate what kind of action you will choose to perform. And then the question arises, to what extent is there free will? And that's a very much of a question under consideration, you know. Uh, but what the purpose of the study and practice of Raj Yoga is to know exactly what kind of karma puts you in bondage and exactly what karma takes you out of bondage. And then also how your shifting of your karmic relationships from being indirect with God and direct with people, places and things to direct with God and indirect with people, places and things because through that you get another kind of karma which is called neutral karma. Mr. Denise, uh, the uh, next stanza that one comes across is the reader is informed that uh, if you make this effort uh, not a single ounce of this effort is lost and the words are even a little bit of this discipline protects one from great danger what is the danger being referred to and and how is it that um, why is this effort so important well you know the word for effort is purusharat purusharat is a word that we use a lot in brahma kumaris to refer to what you do as an individual to move yourself from your current state to a better state. So Purusharat, if you break down the word, you can look at it as Purush, which means a person could be male or female, because it refers to the soul, which is genderless anyway. And then Arat, you can understand that to mean something like for the sake of. So any act that you do for the sake of yourself, is going to produce a fruit which is good for you. And even if it doesn't work, the fact that you're trying, the fact that you're putting in that time and effort uh, with a sincere heart uh, in the understanding that this is what God wants for you, 
there is going to be fruit of that that's going to come to you. So it's a very different kind of effort from the way one strives to gain some personal achievement in the worldly sense, mm. where your achievement will be short-lived and you will enjoy it and then it'll disappear. A spiritual effort is different because it stays with you also for a very long time. Mr. Denise, um, I find this expression particularly curious and thought-provoking. There is only one path for him who knows, but there are many paths for him who does not know. Uh, how would you define this? Take a look at the world today. There are countless religions, countless um, approaches to reality through science, through all kinds of ways. A lot of people feel that any of them are just as good as any other one. But on the other hand, if you recognize God and you recognize that the voice that you're hearing, the instruction that you're getting has to come from God, then there is no uh, substitute. If you don't recognize, then everything looks the same. So I think it's to do with that, whether you recognize or you don't recognize. You get it or you mm. don't get it. Mm. You see or you don't see. Uh, are there those who choose not to see, even though they may be presented with an understanding? I want to qualify my question. There are some who cannot understand. Mm. There are those. Yes. Um, if you have somebody who really knows, who really gets it, who really see, it's pretty visible. So people around them, especially those who are in a spiritual practice, they will know this one understands. You know, you can't make a person understand who isn't able to. And if somebody understands, you can't stop them from understanding. It doesn't matter how many barriers you put. Okay, so we come to a very interesting part of chapter 2 and I'm going to read the text itself so that you can tell us what it means to you. The Vedas are such, it says, that their scope is confined to the three qualities. Be free from those three qualities, Arjuna, indifferent towards the pairs of opposites, eternally fixed in truth, free from thoughts of acquisition and comfort and possessed of the self. What is this particular subject referred to? You have four Vedas and they're a little different from each other uh, but basically they describe to a Hindu um, many different ways of practicing Hinduism rituals um, contains the philosophical angle uh, the Vedic tradition and so on so it's according to the Gita it's got its own limits. So it, it puts people into a tricky situation really because I mean there's a lot of people who think you know the Ramayana, the um, Mahabharata within which there is the Gita are legends, epics and then the Vedas they will put it higher and the Upanishads and all of this and more philosophical, more academic. Uh, but yet within the Gita, which I, I think is really the most ancient one, it's saying don't be fooled by those who put those academic angles at a, in a higher position because they're actually limited. The Gita purports to be spoken by God who is non-human. The Vedas, Upanishads, these are um, collections of uh, um, philosophies which are created by humans. From a human perspective, this which is said to come from God may not come from God. But from God's perspective, God knows who God is and knows that in comparison with himself, the human intellect is by definition limited and um, subject to corruption and is therefore of a lower order. There are just these two angles which are in a sense unresolved in the public mind. Mr. So Denise, um, when I read this particular paragraph, I wondered how does this relate to the way one manages one's own power? 
The question of power is the most intriguing. Of course, God is known to be the Almighty, the Omnipotent, and of a completely different order from anyone else. And I think what God is doing by speaking the Gita is conferring power on Arjuna. And Arjuna has to know how to handle power. And as long as he is ruled by his emotions and his um, loyalty to conventional morality, he's not ready to handle power. And there are also phrases which say that um, you know, the yogi who is able to manage their sense perceptions, they are ready for immortality. You said that g God gives Arjuna power? Well, when you give knowledge, you're giving power. When knowledge is power. One has to read between the lines to get that. <laughs> that doesn't appear from the text. Uh, what uh, God is saying to Arjuna is, you have the potential to be invincible, um, but you're prevented from doing that by your humanness. So go beyond that, and then you come and become a divine person. So, Sister Denise, we've come to the most, uh, one of the most interesting um, stanzas in the entire book which reads as follows, Your right is to action alone, never to its fruits at any time. Never should the fruits of action be your motive. Never let there be attachment to inaction in you. The meaning, if you apply your mind to it, is you should do something and not expect something in return. But Sister Denise, I want you to give me in your answer, how does one apply this practically? If it is human nature that if you do not get some acknowledgement for things that you do, you stop doing it. Well, this is the thing. You have human nature which, as you rightly described, assumes a give and take and acknowledgement and so on. But in the practice of Raj Yoga, you want to get beyond your karmic involvement with other people. And well, you hold on, hold on. There's <laughs> one of those bombs that you just dropped. Say that again. The Gita is saying that you need to come out of your karmic involvement with people. So you want to begin to have a karmic involvement with God. A normal human being, right? A, pr a regular person is engaging with other human beings because that person may well believe in God but doesn't know God, doesn't have a direct interaction with God, is not possible because God is outside the range of that normal person. And what keeps God outside the range of a normal person is this attachment to the fruit of action. So when God says to Arjuna, you must act, but you must not expect the fruit. Or do not act in order to get a fruit. Just do the right action and let it be enough. Because when you have the yoga of knowledge, you know the philosophy of karma. So your main focus is do the right thing. Whether you get a good result or not that happens in the immediate future is in a way none of your business. You have to know the knowledge of the philosophy of karma. So you do the right action and you're making an investment in yourself. When you make an investment which is very long term, the fruit that you get is very enormous. And once you start to do action in relationship with God, you are what's known as you're following Srimat. So the Gita is called Srimat Bhagavad Gita. Shrimat means the supreme directions. So follow the directions of God, knowing that they will lead to very, very good fortune. God is known as Bhagwan, the fortune maker. So just follow the directions. Don't think about what's going to happen, because that makes you human again, ordinary again. So this is why we have to leave the fruit of action. That's not what it's about. Uh, you know, we talked earlier about the castes. 
Yes. And the one who is the merchant caste is always thinking about what am I going to get out of this, which means that person is a lower quality human than the one who does the right thing because it's right. You describe somebody who does something and wants something back in return. That encapsulates almost the entire human population. That's what we have become. We want to be acknowledged. We want to be validated. Um, I once had it said that the worst feeling a human being can have is to feel invisible. If you do something, no one knows you exist. It, you feel as if, what is the point of being alive? Okay, if you're not seen and not heard. Okay, so here's the reader who really loves God, who thinks this Bhagavad Gita is a magnificent scripture. I want to become this. If you find yourself in that position, which, like I said, is the entire human population, but you want to ameliorate yourself, you want to lessen your karmic burden, how do you make the transition from here to here? The Bhagavad Gita is, well, here. And you are here. That's what happens, isn't it? You look at this book and think, this is exactly what I'm not. Okay? How do you rise? Explain how you climb up that ladder, having fallen. <laughs> <laughs> We're looking at the chapter on knowledge. So, in this chapter, you rise by really deeply paying attention to thinking about, cogitating about, you have to really understand the knowledge. And the knowledge is the soul is what's real. And when the soul performs an action, if that is a pure action, the soul will be benefited. And if it's an impure action, the soul will go into loss. And that is all you need to be aware of. And if you are looking for something from another human being, that means you're giving away your power. And that means you're not doing Raj Yoga anymore. Raj Yoga means the yoga through which you become the king. And a king does not ask somebody for approval or validation or anything like that. The king knows I am the king, the king knows I did a pure action, there will be a good result. You don't look for feedback. That is not your level, you see. If you're down, you're looking for feedback because you have fundamental doubt in yourself. But by really studying this, you come to a point where you know who you are and what you are. And if you don't, I mean, if you say you do, but you act like you don't, it means you don't. The way of rising is to actually get it. That's what we were talking earlier. Some people get it. Some people never get it. They will say, yes, but. <laughs> and go back to the old thing, you see. But somebody who gets it will stop in their tracks and say, come again? Would you say that again? Oh, this. All right. And they, you, you, their whole consciousness is shifting, which you'll find in the Gita is the word smriti. You see, in Wh which means smriti means awareness. But you'll find in your translation that it's generally uh, translated as memory. One of the difficulties with the Gita is that any translation is an interpretation, and the interpretation is determined by the fundamental philosophy of life of the translator, because if the translator doesn't get it, you won't either. Um, so mm. what is in the original text is um, the material that you try to work with, because then you, you have a number of different um, possibilities. Like, for example, in the, in the stanza that you just read, um, our karma is translated as non-action. But in Brahma Kumaris, we would not translate our karma to be non-action. We would translate it as neutral action. That means action which does not put you in profit or loss. And there is that type of action. Okay, Sister Denise, I, um, 
I'm surprised that we only did uh, three paragraphs in this entire episode, but uh, they were so riveting. Um, your answers were so riveting that I'm glad that we managed to go to these subjects in depth. And um, well, a myriad of questions have arisen, which we will take up in the episodes to come. So there you have it. So thank you, Sister Denise, for joining us today. Uh, like I said, I expected to do more than three pages, but uh, the answers were so deep and powerful that uh, I thought it best that you, the viewer, get as much information as possible as to what the Bhagavad Gita means by the terms of the theory of Samkhya, the bondage of karma, and also what it means to have knowledge, what it means to have this wisdom, what do you do with it and how you empower yourself with it. Mm, I also like to know how to apply that which is written in this ancient text to our practical life. And Sister Denise has been kind enough to, to give us some uh, realistic examples. Um, if uh, you are in a state where you're not sure you understand, then I invite you to stay tuned for the next episode where we will explore Chapter 2 further. So Sister Denise will be able to share with us um, what the full message is that is contained in Chapter 2, including what is meant by the three gunas. So thank you for joining us and thank you, Sister Denise. Thank you. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>